I'm Isra Adahir. I'm a psychosocial coordinator. I'm working in Beit Atfal Sumud for six years. I will give a brief history about Beit Atfal Sumud and its goals. It's called the National Institution of Social Care and Vocational Training. It's known as Beit Atfal Sumud BAS. It's a non-governmental organization and it's not related to any political and religious groups. It was established in 1976 after the Zatar massacre to provide assistance and accommodation for orphan children who lost their parents during the massacre. Our aim is to develop Palestinian community in Lebanon through providing services according to people needs and of course to empower skills of youth, uh, women, children and parents. Our vision is to have uh, justice, peace and freedom. We provide all a lot of services. I can summarize it. Education, social development, health and relief. And we are working all over Lebanon. Uh, we have centers from north and south and in Beirut and in Saida. We lot a lot of services. We have a lot of programs such as family happiness project. We have health projects. We have education projects. We have art and culture projects. And we have sports, scouts, and embroidery. Our work focused more when we have like crisis. We are in COVID-19, currency inflation, and the hard uh, economic situation. So we have a lot of things to do, and we look for a lot of sources to help and support Palestinian people in the camps. Because I think Camilia, she she was with us in Burj Shamali camp, and she was participating in Lib, and she touched how is the life there and how is the situation in the camps. So we are doing our best. To, to help our people, to help our children, and to support them. Shireen Saad will be moderating the talk today. Shireen is a Beirut-born, Brooklyn-based arts journalist working on the intersection of creativity and social change. She's interviewed visionaries like Adenis, Marina Abramovic, and Simon Fattal. She holds an MA in arts journalism from Columbia and has written two books, she also has a podcast, Hiyim, mapping the revolutionary female voices of Arab music. Our speaker today, Camilia Maima Youssef, is a Lebanese poet, writer, and teacher from Dearborn, Michigan. She's currently an MFA candidate in poetry at NYU. Camilia is working on a few poetry manuscripts and also a play. I'm so excited to have her here today with Shireen. I'm sure many of us will find so much connection and relatability in their conversation. Thank you, Lara for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Isra, so much for joining us and for the work you're doing and uh, for that wonderful introduction. And I really encourage everybody to look up Beit Atfal Sumud to donate and support Beit Atfal um, And they're doing incredible work for the kids um, and the whole community um, in the Palestinian community, the Palestinian refugee community in Lebanon. I will start. Uh, I'm a little nervous, usually in a big room when everybody's like doing a poetry reading, when we're doing a poetry reading and everybody's there, uh, you can like feel the vibe. But uh, I can feel the vibe here. Everybody's like chilling, doing their thing. Thank you. If anybody wants to turn on their cameras, turn on your cameras. I'm sure you look amazing on this Saturday morning. Um, so I will just start with a poem, but I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Um, just to have a little bit more engagement. And a lot of my poems, I think, are meant to be uh, seen on the page. I'm very interested in um, being heard in silence. And reading is, in a lot of ways, a very silent activity. And it's also super loud. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so that you guys can experience what I experience. Uh, and also, uh, just fair warning, my cat will probably jump in and out of the uh, screen uh, or like from behind me so don't be startled. This one is called The Right Speak. Halo, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I laugh this class. Today happy. Tomorrow busy. Nice to me, too, too. The way students greet each other in my English as another language classroom feels like the way we should be speaking in the first place. I am God today. 
as you got to? Love poem. At 3.13 p.m., you almost basically said you wanted to marry me. In a film essentially about Arab death, Godard said it would take a whole day to tell the story of one second. This is an offering for my grandmothers who taught me to love in the village way. In those minutes, I stood on a ground that would not sway. I tried to fall a little. I trip on purpose sometimes to know I can. I fall indeed and do not get lost in a place I cannot map beneath these inky waters. I bathe and swim in this oasis in a droughted place. Seven times I run between the door and the mountain of clothes in my apartment I dance. A water springs through the fake hardwood floor. Our sudden sun, Abrahamic cherubim parched in illuminate laminate light, bends onto his knees in desert dust, preys on the rug I got from Amazon. It's really soft, you should try it. I give it five stars. Miracled water, oracled light, the sky opened an eye. I, I make a playlist of the feeling of you. I build a mansion for you in my mind. I make a detailed itinerary for our life, a long list of the lists I will list to you in my own voice one day, in a mermaid city after we visit our cousins in the alien sky. We drink the ara of the moon, cheers over a plate of raw liver at our table in the sky, maybe a little bit of salt. I will eat you without salt. I will drink casks of the tears of your past, have my coffee with your salt. I would eat a bundle of hearts, suck cardamom seed, a little bitter for your favor. Be the little gristle in my teeth a little. Why don't you let me sink my soft in your brain? Call it a, call it a, call it. I can't say that yet, but call it salt. I will salt you forever in dinner on my heart. Two healths for your mind if I eat you with salt and give you a liver. Call it a map. Let us lick off our fingers the text of it. Let it sit. A tattoo of a falling salt. This is a poem uh, I wrote uh, during a really difficult time. And then when the Lebanese revolution in October happened, uh, this poem became more clear to me as to why it happened or why I wrote it. Um, and a lot of this stuff is kind of uh, in process of being edited through my manuscript. So thank you for being here in the process, guys. Love, we develop a lexicon. Once upon a meaning, there was a morning to life. It puts on its prettiest earrings in the infinite mirror. Infinity, you are a snail unhurried. Infinity, you are a dream blinked away at dawn. Infinity, you skip a stone, a star across this tongue. Infinity, you wear me in silence and sing me these bones. Infinity, you are a cloak, the universe hemmed into your lining. Infinity, you are a woman. The ocean of the infinite licks the mortal shore. Here, the infinity we eat for dinner. A world will perish and we have been sending warnings in private. A world will be birthed and we have only known to attend funerals. Here's a song for Beirut. Song for Beirut. Place Beirut everywhere does the sound land on the crescent hip of a moon. A wisp of smoke seeks a lung. A street seeks a never ending. Beirut is every future what could not have been because of what is and is anyway. Look to her. She holds our small universes in her palm. Salvation or solution, one will come. A sudden night, 
A yard in Brooklyn wakes our countries into a long song of place, of place. Muse is you, ya Beirut, lady of everywhere and all the no places at all. You are the meat of my planet, of my never ever hometown. Let me sing. I'm gonna just go down through this one. <clears throat> Inheritance. After Khalid Matala. I do not recognize my face like I do not recognize the fixed stars, though I meet myself each day and the stars each night. I, no prophet by blood, but inheritance. And yes, I do speak to God in faith at the end of evidence. I, a distant heir of Olaya, she has given me her riddling mouth, which laughs and lusts in a sounded silence plays on the tongue and in history's dust. A bitter myrrh seeds in my throat, grows slow with each moon, grows with each slow moon, set alight by the spitfire of Walada, an immortal lady whose words lay men to ash. My eyes from the seamstress stitching scarves from trims of silk to veil women after Taimur's sacking of Damascus. Thick lined with the kohl of Umm Ali's inkwell, warding off evil with my dead grandmother's incantations. Fields farmed for Fakhreddin valley my cheeks, all the fallahin in my family line, crops for centuries stolen, unharvested, sitting in brine, in the cellar forgotten after the final father's going away. Jurhum and his perished tribe hide in the white of my eye, silent ship in the lawless sea, carrying all 80 of Nuh's compatriots to hide in the safety of memory. Before the age of nations, I lived among fallen jun juniper, carved into busts of mothers by hands leathered by knives and pride, and I waited in a kingless womb. My nose I relinquished favor of the country of its absence, to live with my kith and kin, those whose nations live between the eyes and in daily, in daily resurrection make beauty and mourning. And by my chin swears the scribe who gathered the tragedies in a book buried beneath the cistern from which I am still paling. Notes on this poem. Olaya bint al-Mahdi, princess, daughter to Abbas al-Khalif and her mother, a singer and concubine. She wrote in riddles when her half-brother Harun al-Rashid barred her from saying her lover's name in her poem songs. Walada, also a princess, daughter of an Andalusian caliph, hosted poetry lessons for women of all classes and poetry competitions at which she met her lover, the poet Ibn Zaydun, who eventually cheated on her. And thus, she wrote seething, sharp, satirical poems about him. Jirhum is fable, fabled to have been the originator of the Arabic language, and he was a passenger on Noah's Ark. Fakhreddin was an early leader of a somewhat, somewhat united Lebanon under the Ottoman Empire. He propagated a feudal system and ruled over much of, pre of present-day Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, including Jabal Amil, which is where my family originates. Taimur, conqueror and founder of the Timurid dynasty, known for brutal conquests and achievements in the arts. Some trace the widespread dawning of what we know today as hijab to his brutal attacks on Damascus and specifically Damascene women in 1400, after which veiling was used as a method of protection in wartime, which is not its contemporary practice, Though when, these days, is it not wartime? So this is where I'm getting a little bit into some of my research, guys, um, which is about Etel Adnan, and I'm giving you a sneak peek. So thank you for being a part of this. Um, this will eventually maybe be published somewhere. 
I want to be mindful of time, so I might skip through some of this. Atal Adnan is an Arab woman artist. She was born in 1925 when the world's layers of socio-political histories found their intersection in her identity and her home. She was born during the French colonial mandate in Lebanon, the brief period in which the French occupied Lebanon and Syria after the fall of the Ottoman Empire until 1941. The European powers carved borders into our bones, the collective body partitioned into secret parts, into discrete parts, each controlled by a different brain center. Atal's father was a Syrian Sunni Muslim officer for the Ottoman army. Her mother was a Greek Christian from Smyrna, a city inhabited first by its indigenous, then controlled by the varying empires between the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Ottomans, and the modern day Turkish nation state. Her father was a friend of General Ataturk, and her, he and his wife moved from Turkey to Beirut so he could lead an Arab army there on Ataturk's command. There was no such Arab army in Beirut, and the French colonial entity never hired him. So at the age of 38, Atal Adnan's father was an Arab between empires and was never formally employed since. Atal Adnan is not only our art and like, she's our contemporary. Um, and she's alive with us and making work uh, as we speak. Um, God bless her. So this is, she comes to us with all of this. Um, the problem is that we now know the world, especially we now know it is known, inventoried, and possessed. No land remains unowned or at least unmeasured by engineers at Al Adnan of Cities and Women. A new flag has yet to be designed for Iraq, Fawaz Trabulsi, the new Iraqi flag. My father was Uranos and my mother was Queen Zenobia. I am the initial fish rejected on the beach but determined to live. Atal Adnan, the Beirut Hell Express. All of this within 30 years. All of these flags. On some streets, Lebanon spoke Arabic, on others, French. In villages, Arabic, others, French. At homes, Arabic, others, French. Atal's home, Turkish, Greek, and French, and occasionally Arabic, and Atal's French missionary school, French. Quote. The method used to teach French to the children was in itself a kind of psychological conditioning against which nobody objected. The people thinking that whatever nuns do is always good and for the best. So there was a system in which all, the, in, there was a system in all the French run schools which charged a few selected students to spy on the others. Anybody heard in class or in recreation speaking Arabic was punished and a little stone was immediately put into the pocket of that child. Speaking Arabic was equated with the notion of sin. Atal Adnan to write in a foreign language. The colonial strategy of punishing students who speak their native tongue reverberates across time. The severing of tongue, a material object of identity. In 1970, my father attended a French language private school on scholarship in Northern Lebanon. His school was run by Lebanese natives who spoke French. He too was punished by the teachers for speaking Arabic and he recalls that same stone. In my father's school, it was a single stone called Le Signal. Each student who spoke Arabic would have to pass the stone to the next person who dared speak in their native tongue, and so on and so forth. At the end of the school day, the teacher would ask the class, Qui a le signal? The student with the stone would raise their hand. Qui te l'a donné? The student would point to the student who gave it to them. Qui te l'a donné? And so on and so forth. Little by little, a whole generation of educated boys and girls felt superior to the poorer kids who did not go to school and spoke only Arabic. Arabic was equated with backwardness and shame. Years later, I learned that the same thing was happening all over the French Empire in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Black Africa, and Indochina. That's an odd one. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm aware of time. What can I say of the fact that I do not use my native tongue and do not have the most important feeling that as a writer I should have, the feeling of a direct communication with, watch, with one's audience? It's like asking what I would have been if I were somebody else. There are no answers to such questions. These questions are like trying to hold reflections in one's hand. There are a growing number of writers who use an international language, like English, who in fact use another language than their own because of history, because of exile, 
or because of personal taste. Frustrated with the ubiquity of French in the streets in their home, Atal Adnan's father insisted that she learn Arabic. He first took up the task himself and tried to teach her using a grammar book, but being a man vanquished in the war, a witness to the end of an empire for which he fought, got wounded and decorated, this Ottoman officer was not a pedagogue. He instructed young Etel to copy the grammar book word for word, and so she would learn Arabic, a language that to her was neither foreign nor familiar. She never fully learned the Arabic language. It remained to her a forbidden paradise. I am both a stranger and a native to the same land, to the same mother tongue. Decades later, Atel turned to copying Arabic strip, script word for word in her artistic practice. She took up makimono, an accordion-like Japanese style of art book making in which each page can be read either on its own or connected to the larger whole. Something from my childhood emerged, the pleasure of writing line after line, Arabic sentences which I understood very imperfectly. I took modern poetry written by the major Arab poets and worked with them. I did not try to have them translated to me. I was satisfied with the strange understanding of them, bits here and there, sentences where I understood but one key word. It was like seeing through a veil, looking at an extraordinary scenery through a scene, as if the screen did not erase images but toned them down, made them look even more mysterious than they were. This is her copying of al Hallaj. In 2013, I served as the principal for an Arab American run summer school in the Burj Shmeli Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. Our goal was to prepare the students for the high school entrance exam. The only way to be accepted into high school in Lebanon was to take an English or French language exam, neither of which is the student's native tongue, Arabic. At the time, the passing rate for Palestinian refugee, refugee youth was less than 30%. If you could have any job in the world, what would it be? I am walk in the moon. If you could have any job in the world, what would it be? Palestinian. At our summer school closing ceremony, one of the students passed me a thank you note. It wasn't written in English nor Arabic, but in Lughat al-Nat, the language of the internet, which is the Arabic language transliterated into English letters using specific numbers to signify the letters that English does not contain. Wikipedia calls this the Arabic chat alphabet. I regret to say that I could not find the letter in my files, but in it, the student expressed his gratitude and also told me that this is the only language which he knew how to write. Where they go. The page for languages, if scanned with the eyes, quickly like one would a browser, will feature on more than one line, extinct in italics, but not italic. My thumb swiping suddenly becomes a funeral, and I imagine the last jiddo, I mean grandfather, I mean mean as in mean as in who? Whose mother tongue transliter transliterated into another tongue? Am I helping one language stay alive by the act of consumption? And I mean alive as in living in this country that is my body. I order tongue at a restaurant. Because of the cut of meat I requested, the man asks me if I am from that village. I wanted tongue and raw liver. In that language, no, one no longer says that the person one loves is one's liver. It is the grandmothers who say this, who said this, those livers. I am told this is a common term of endearment. In this language and that one, no one has ever called me their liver. I want to be called a liver by someone who accidentally types I instead of O, like Jamal wrote, and then understand, and then someone understands that this too is true. This language cuts open a word, like Nizar wrote, carves meaning out of its belly, leaves the carcass out to dry. A funeral procession marches in my mind for the ones made gone without ado. What happens when the world swallows the tongue or a nation? Oh, all these travelers. And these are excerpts, the last bit. Excerpts from a longer project called A Book with a Hole in It. And this part, I will title it Arab American Fragments. Um, this is a long poem that is excerpts from my journals. 
um, and it works almost like a novel. And so you can read it as such. Uh, there's, it's kind of just a stream as life streams. Um, and so I'll start. The poem is a facade, is an edifice, is a door you can open to find more doors. There in all of them, even when she is invisible. The long ones are a search for truth, a making of a land, and inviting others to live there. She is the reason I poet. She the first reason the world didn't make sense. At family dinners, I practiced the silence of her name, the name of a star. I feel so far from a history and a knowledge that belongs to me. Language is the key, but it only opens one door. Language is occlusion. Words are separate from what they represent. No evidence, no proof, nothing to show. The small, tiny neurons of memory that contain me. I have gotten myself to this very place. Coffee. A reckoning. Got here and stay here. They flow into me and not out of me. They create, accumulate as debris in my mind. Subway ads, every single one. White, 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 perfect text, aesthetic form, perfect, perfect, white, white, every ad, something about whiteness. What matters is this is an affront. We are not asked, we are told. I am read. It is whiteness that gives my body value in this economy. It is whiteness that wants me to keep this whiteness all to myself. It is whiteness that does not believe in giving and having nothing left. I am always standing next to a white version of me that everyone sees and I am telling them that this is not me. I am Camilla Omaima Abbas Mahmoud Salim Hassan Yusuf. It makes me miss my nose, which sometimes would let me pass for Jewish, but never as white, white. They treated me so, so well, but I was terrified of having white kids or kids who would ever think that they're white. What constitutes whiteness in America? Mama got married to escape war and stayed in poverty. There is a global whiteness to talk about here. If my family had stayed, I would be whiter than the Filipina, Bengali, Nigerian, Ethiopian, Egyptian, Syrian domestic workers. I would not be as white as the Christian women of Lebanon, but I'd be as white as my diamond trading Muslim cousin. Mostly my own frustration with the invisibility. I have felt isolated, alone, targeted, fired by white people, shamed by them, pushed to assimilate culturally by them, talked down to by them. Maybe it's not me. Maybe it's just white culture. I have never lost myself in whiteness. I keep coming back. I watched the sunlight fall through the window. There was a steeple of light on my floor. I chastised myself for my small vocabulary. You can control what the language holds and sometimes language is empty. Keep the marbles in your pocket. Don't eat the candy all at once. I gave one to Marwa and one to Seher. I gave one to Besma and one to my date. Here are all my intergenerational traumas, here to protect me. I am waiting for the other shoe to drop, and I am also watching it dangle in the air like a constellation. Thank you so much for such beautiful poetry. I think we're in a time where we're feeling a lot of pain, and your full poetry has pain and war and tragedy, but also a lot of love, joy, humor, uh, beauty, and hope. Uh, and that comes from your own experience as a uh, Lebanese born and Dearborn and experiencing uh, the homeland from afar. And I like the idea that uh, Adnan states, uh, you know, the idea of a forbidden paradise. And I think uh, that's clear through your poetry as well. And also the idea of poems um, that lead to the making of a land. So tell us about your upbringing in Detroit and your early experience of poetry and how it helped you get through these sort of identity um, questionings that you were experiencing. Ooh. Thank you very much for that, Shireen, and for your question. Um, I'm going to try to answer it as concisely as I can and also try to capture as much. So the question is, what is my experience growing up in Detroit and how did that help construct the identity that I have today and over time? I think that's the question. Um, well, my parents are both uh, immigrants to uh, Detroit. Um, my dad came in 80, and my dad came in 79, my mom came in 83. 
I was born in America. I English. I did not speak English for the first few years of my life. Uh, and then my parents taught me to read English. And then I went to school and I didn't know that I was American. I thought every there's, I just thought that I, how do I say this? Um, when we'd, when we'd recite this, the Pledge of Allegiance in America, I never recited the Pledge of Allegiance in class. I would say to the United States of Lebanon and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under Allah. That was, I was in second grade. Uh, I can't control that. That was how a lot of us, and I'm not the only one, you know, a lot of my friends and peers growing up in Dearborn is a very unique experience in the greater like Arab diasporic or Arab American experience um, because in the like we didn't really experience racism growing up I'm not we I'm not speaking for we I personally didn't experience racism growing up only from my white teachers who would like try to silence me or like so like but like having people say things to us about like being Muslim or being anything like was and we never got it because everybody was like us. Um, and then the racism actually was from the Lebanese to everybody else. And there's like, that was like a very kind of a microcosm of an experience um, of the Arab American experience was this idea of like Lebanese dominance and like this, like I, and which was like very colorized and racialized in a strange way. And like, um, so I'm kind of rambling, um, but how your parents got here i think uh, their story is really incredible and and how they experienced lebanon from a distance oh yeah i mean so the the year that my dad immigrated he got um uh, he randomly this was during the war and he had randomly gotten a uh like i think it was a lottery he, he came here by by a lottery by visa lottery and the there was, um, and he came in 79, he was issued that visa in 79. Also in 79, there's one historian who talks about this. His name is Ahmed Baidun in this book called Vintage Bell, Michigan. Um, and in this book, he talks about the fact that the United States in 1979, in response to the Iranian revolution, targeted specifically in the South Lebanon, where the unions were the strongest, um, the workers' unions, the shoemakers' union in particular, and in Vintage Bell, um, they issued mass visas to people in Bintish Bel uh, in order to lay uh, the, the workers' union. They wanted to empty the workers' union. This is during the Cold War. It's Cold War strategy. And then at one point in uh, the 1980s, there were, in Bintish Bel itself, there were 2,000 people from Bintish Bel in Bintish Bel and 6,000 people from Bintish Bel in Dearborn, Michigan. And so this is one of the ways that the Cold War affects us today. This opened up, of course, like a power gap and, and you know, different militant groups came in, different political groups came in. And uh, that's kind of, and so I don't know if specifically, I have to maybe do a FOIA, if my dad came as a result of these specific like wave of worker visas, um, but that's my theory. and. Um, and also, like, it was the same year, and he um, also, this is something I don't actually say in public, um, mainly because of America and, and Cold War politics and what lives with, and imperialism lives with us today, but my parents were leftists, and as much as they could be, and then they came here. Um, and uh, I'm being, I'm not going to say more. Um, if you know me, if you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, you can say more, and we can talk more. And then my mom, my, oh my God, there's like so much, like the visa stories, you guys are like really, um, everybody has their own, how do you escape a war? You, you scrape, you know? So um, my mother's story was a story of scraping and coming. That one I also don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing because it's a public space and I'm scared for my family. Like. You know, Rasmia Aude got deported right at the end of, like, because of her um, activism and because of her work. She got deported from the United States because uh, they said that she had lied on her application uh, to citizenship in America. 
Um, and so a lot of our stories, when we tell our true stories, you know, there's a fear of always kind of like the surveillance eye watching you. So a lot of like asking each other direct stories. And I think this is what a lot of my work is about. When we tell, there's a lot of silence around our stories and a lot of it is a result of trauma. And like, there are so many of us who have traumatized stories that kind of we tell to ourselves or, but we, we don't share them in a public space. And part of my work is gradually figuring out how to say, 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 um, without putting people in danger or hurting people. That's amazing. So as an immigrant, uh, I guess you lived in sort of in, in this wrap by this silence or living in the, in the shadow, your family. Um, is, was there any shame or was there acceptance of, you know, American culture? And then how did poetry, how did you encounter poetry at first and how did you find the healing power of poetry? Mm. Um, so my parents were the immigrants. I was born here. The experience, of, the question right before poetry was uh, about shame, about being, and, and like how it felt to be American. Is that the question? Um, uh, I mean, being American for my family growing up, and I'm like going to give you very high school, middle school stories, like in formative years, being American meant being sexual, you know, being American was totally a gendered thing. Being American was what you wore, you know, and, and don't be like the American girls. Don't, don't go be free. Don't go do this in the street. Don't go do that. Even though my parents were very open-minded progressives, you know, um, but I still grew up with a lot of internal, even with open-minded progressives, there's a lot of internalized misogyny. We are all misogynistic. Every single one of us, we're all homophobic. We're all racist. We're all this. Everybody is. It doesn't mean that it's okay. It means that we need to reckon with that truth inside of us. So I say this to say my parents, the amazing progressives that they were still in internalized misogyny did not miss us. Um, and, um, so there was that, the gendered idea of like what it meant to be a Um And there was also this idea of being American. A lot of these are really fresh raw questions. So I'm like very excited to answer them. You're getting um, just kind of raw answers from me. My being American also uh, was about f like, what's the word I'm looking for? It was like a form of like a professionalizing this idea of the capitalist idea of what it means to be American and like what it means to be self-sufficient and what it means to be successful in the capitalist paradigm and, and how to present yourself with language and how to pass your accent. I like, I, rem I used, the way I used to speak in high school is not how I'm speaking now. And I think my evolution of code switching over time is, has like evolved and I don't even know what my original voice sounds like because of the way that uh, like language has shifted in different spaces and, and how you survive. And um, so American, being American meant sounding um, in a particular way. Um, being American meant proximity to whiteness. You know, a lot of people, my family grew up, we were, uh, we, everybody was very secular in my immediate family and some of my extended family. And so being people looked at us and would say we were American because we weren't religious. They just, there weren't very many secular people in our community or there were, and they were just, you know, chill and silent, living their lives. Um, and so we were called Americanized, even though we all spoke Arabic and learned it and re read and wrote and tried at least, you know. Um, so let's so, talk a little bit more about poetry and the first yeah. poems you read, what you loved about them. I know you read a lot of Arab poets, um, both contemporary and, uh, you know, from the past. And you started teaching poetry um, workshops, which was a really, it's still a really important part of your process. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about poetry. So uh, the first time I, I used to want to, I, I was like, very active in politics and activism. Um, that was my first calling, I guess, like even through high school. Um, we just, like the war in 2006 happened and there was no choice but to go pass petitions around or do something, feel like you were doing something, you know? Um, so we, 
uh, I came to poetry through that feeling, you know. I read a Suhair Hamad poem. I watched a video of her performing uh, when I was, my gosh, like 17. And I was moved to tears. And I became obsessed with how she made sound happen um, and how the sound sounded both like Um Kalthum and like hip hop at the same time. And it was so nice to be able to find a home in, as a child in diaspora. Um, and so Suhair was the first one that made it possible to even articulate a poem that felt anything like home for me. You know, I would, and so I, I would start there. And then um, I want to say, I, like, I want to trace the whole, like, poetry journey for you. Um, and there's, there's just so much of it that should be an essay itself. Um, this combination of Suhair's poetry and the reading of uh, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye around, I read, I did encounter both of those at the same time. Um, and the bluest eye uh, changed the way that I saw myself. Uh, it changed the way that I understood Black Americans to be. It changed the way that uh, I, what I thought was possible in literature. Um, and uh, I think those, that's when like the, the world kind of broke open. You know, poetry I think is about like your mind experience having an authentic experience with the world and then whatever you synthesize from like what you gather from the world i see poetry as a missive coming out of those like moments of like pure existence of like i i take in i take in and what i produce what i take what i what comes out of me what i hear ringing in my brain that um is like a really pure voice and uh reading those two texts, they actually broke uh, like the mold for me. They let me know that like other possibilities were possible. Um, and then m as of more recently, I've been reading, um, just like trying to find Arab, there's another, a line in the, a book with a hole in it that says, where are an Arab woman's journals for me to page through? Um, and I just want, the voices we we are missing so many narratives from uh arab women femmes queers like there's nothing we don't we don't get told any of these stories what what poetry is recited in schools whose humanity is asserted you know in the mainstream in in whatever even among families and so um a lot of my work has been kind of like playing catch up with history. I have a bunch of like anthologies of Arab women's poetry from there's one and, and the poem inheritance comes out of the engagement with those poems of like here, it, it, it all started actually, I'm gonna just be very brief. This actually started with Arabic pop music. I was trying to find songs that like reflected like my mood, my, the one Arabic, like when thinking of like political Lebanon, like what is the song that got me, that, that riled me up, that matched my energy, that matched my affect? Um, Miriam Klink's Klink Revolution. Okay. It was the, like this song that like where it's like a dance beat. I wish I could play it for you guys right now. And, but, and then a dance beat. And then also just like she's talking about tires burning in the street, corrupt politicians, everything. And she was doing this in 2012. And everybody made fun of her for it. But it was genius. And so like I was trying to find that kind of anger, that kind of like something to really like be able to let you feel fully the experience that you get from your own life matched in a piece of art. I was looking for that anger, that kind of catharsis, and I found it in Arab women's poetry that was written centuries ago, a century ago, 80 years ago, 20 years ago, all of it feels like we're kind of living in this, um, I don't want to say that there's no progress, but the idea of progress is not linear. You know, to expect progress to be linear is absurd. Um, rather, I just, I, I was upset that I would read Nazik and Malaika's work and also with like a quarter 
a third of a tongue in, of Arabic, truly, when I'm reading, you know, um, although I do make a practice of translation, intentionally translating poetry. Now, like the, the poems that she wrote could have been written in Dearborn in 2014, you know? And it's like we have carried all of our traumas and all of our oppressive systems with us and they manifest themselves first in the family. So for you, teaching is basically an act of countering this um, oppression and sharing this, this history that you're learning about yourself and also sharing links with other uh, migrant uh, immigrant writers or other writers, outside of writers uh, with, a, with a sort of a marginalized perspective, right? Indeed, yeah, I think that uh, First of all, teaching. So when I say that this, like these oppressions live within our families, it's very true. If we all dealt with the issues within our families and found ways to successfully manage them, we would be able to like maybe solve the problems of the world, you know, but it, it does live in the domestic space. And I think of teachers, teachers live, can have like a really strong impact on people's lives. And in, like an inimitable impact. They enter our intimate, like intellectual space, our developmental space. And this isn't to say that I want to indoctrinate everybody, but like this is like having teaching as an art. I, I feel like when I come up with lesson plans, I would I use the same part of my brain and flow that I do when I'm writing a poem, which is like, how do we arrive at a destination together? How do we not leave anybody behind? And how do we make each, even like, so I loved teaching and I love especially, I hated teaching, sorry. I will do it if I have to teach in a traditional English classroom, but it's a flattening of language and you're teaching children to flatten their language. And so I think that teaching is truly a way to be able to decolonize the self. And it's a decolonization process for the teacher as well. And it's not that the teacher is in a position of power where I'm, I'm saving the students, although I have also succumbed to the white, like what is known as the white savior mentality in teaching, whereas, and I was teaching my own people from my own community um, of this idea that like, I am the teacher and I'm gonna save everybody. That's not what we're doing. We're all here to like get liberated together. And so how do we do it? You are now a part of the conspiracy. Like we are conspiring together. Students and teachers can be comrades and they should be. And, Fred, speaking of connecting with other communities, the work of Fred Moten, um, who's an incredible poet, theorist, thinker, person in study, like just black radical enigma, yani, who is also like, he's, he talks about study as a collective task. This is an act of study right here. Um, I would recommend to everybody, if you haven't read The Undercommons, please go ahead and read it, especially those of us who are in universities or institutions. Um, and this idea of like, there's so much labor and I'm just gonna, part of the experience of being in America is also a part of recognizing, um, we live in black labor, what the result, the result of black labor and the ongoing black and brown labor, this is what we live in. And anybody in America who thinks that they are separate from like any kind of complicitness in terms of, uh, how we benefit from exploited labor and racialized labor is living a delusion, uh, living a delusion and it is going, the chickens will come home to roost eventually to quote Malcolm X. And so this idea of like the imminent task of being in America is also of reckoning with American history and reckoning with the American present and trying to find the truth in yourself and reckon with the truth in yourself as we, excuse me, I'm like preaching, but like this, I hope I'm not, but this, um, you have to rec like reckon with your relationship to whiteness and to blackness and to indigenousness and to land and to language. These are all tasks among all of us. This can be done in the classroom um, and this should be done in the private space and among friends. So, yeah. yeah. And so let's talk about decolonizing language because it's a very important part of your process as well. You write in English with some Arabic words and some words um, that you've heard children uh, say in your workshop. Uh, so I love, I love that idea of the musicality of the language of, and the rhythm, of course. Of, and you love music, so it all kind of comes together so beautifully in your poetry. Um. Decolonizing language and music. Shin, you have amazing questions. 
So I'm just gonna like try to capture them. They like, cause they, there's, there's so much. So it's very generative. So I appreciate these very much. So decolonizing language and music. I think that first, I mean, um, have you ever like listened to yourself and listened to your own thoughts? And like, just like sat, like in meditation, you sit or do something called automatic writing where like the, you just put your pen to your paper and you just let whatever flow flow. Sometimes I wonder about that practice and how, what it can cover, what it can uncover about the subconscious, what it can uncover about genetic memory, what it can, what, how it can be like, um, like a channeling. Um, and so part of my one, one relationship that I have to music, and I say, I say this a lot because I don't know how to play any musical instruments. Um, I am a deep appreciator of music. Uh, music, you know, everybody's like music saves my life. Music saves moments. Music, uh, uh, you can be saved by a song, you know. Like there, like after um, after the bombing in two thousand in, in uh, August fourth, uh, playing Lebanon Rahirja in the car to the loudest extent that I possibly could, just gives gave me a kind of catharsis and peace that would not have happened if I did not listen to that song. If that song didn't physically interact with my molecules. And that's what music is. Music is an interaction. And so um, sometimes I think about the ways that our internal music is interrupted and, and how like some of us are estranged from our own, Marx talks about this, alienation from our own human sociality, like where we are alienated from our natural state of being because of capitalism. And so if you, if you say, how can I get to know myself when my, lang when my language has been taken from me, my identity has been taken from me, somebody might have like, I have the privilege of, of living a white life if I had so chosen and like just to meld into white culture and just like, you know, live, live my life that way. And it's possible, it's definitely a possibility in America for me to do it as a white passing person, no matter how brown or how dark my features are, or how often somebody passes by me and says, are you Persian? Or are you like, you're, you know, you're from that part of the world. And I'm just like, bro, like, you know? So I say that to say like, there's a possibility of erasing the self. And that's part of what, what, what white privilege is. I would have had to reckon with a lot of dissonance inside of myself. It feels like I would have maybe gone crazy, you know, but, so part of the act of decolonization, I think on a mass scale and on an individual scale is like knowing who you are, finding a moment of peace within yourself, peeling back all the layers of constructed identity that you've done. I was working for a long time as a teacher. I was working for a while as a teacher and I was working in, um, uh, in corporate America for a little bit. I can talk about that at another time it was horrible, but like that, I just, I lost access to my own voice and I lost access to my own identity. And so poetry was what brought me back, which is like exploring that natural voice inside of myself and letting it flow. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Camille. What a, an incredible presentation. And I love your ideas too. And I can't wait to, to see what you do next. We can have a question from Reef. Um, this question is uh, very curious to hear about Camelia's favorite mediums to share her poetry. Performance like we saw today, physical manifestations like books and art pieces. And what else have you explored, Camelia? Oh, in terms of mediums? Okay. Um, so I am, I have a couple of mediums. Um, and medium is actually, my favorite medium is readings with friends. Um, that's the, that's my favorite one. That's the one that's the most satisfying. Um, and just like being in pre like presence with other people and sharing, that is the most magical experience I can have. 
Um, I have also, and I've had like a contentious relationship with publishing as somebody with anxiety. I like think that the way that the publishing structure is right now with gatekeepers is not inclusive at all. Um, and it like, uh, I think that there are, we don't teach people enough. Um, like there's like a, my first semester in my MFA for anybody who's thinking about going to an MFA, my first semester in MFA, I uh, asked my professor, I was like, okay, listen, I have all this work. I want to publish it. How do I help me do that? She's like, no, no, just focus on writing. I was like, no, no, I have all the writing. My, my literal step is how do I share? And like, as an, this goes back to, again, this idea of this, my experience as an Arab woman, which is that I keep my, I don't, my poems are very, like I have work that's erotic. I don't know if I'm ever going to share it. Uh, I have I have I have work that is uh, that talks about family secrets. How, what are we going to do about it, guys? Uh, I have work, and I'm like part of it is like my work. A book with a hole in it is exactly that. How do I say everything without saying something without without saying the thing? And and if I am saying something in the absence of the thing, am I still saying it? Am I have I said it effectively? And so this idea of like what is like. So I'm very interested in semiotics to say that as well.